All right, hopefully we are live now, having all kinds of technical issues. Just busted it out of court and got back a little late and wanted to figure out if it's going to actually work. I'm having an issue with YouTube at the moment. So let's get on TikTok. Go live here. Let's see, live now. Watching. All right, so we appear to be live. Let's see, we're live on this end. We're live on TikTok, it looks like. Yes, just give a couple minutes to see if anybody joins in. Okay, looks like people are joining on TikTok. Let's go back to YouTube and check YouTube. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm your lawyer, Patrick McGeehan, and I am your best friend at your worst time. Welcome to Law on the Life Live. We had a little bit of technical difficulty getting YouTube up and running today. That piled with uh, you know, a lot of court today. I just literally got back in, ran in here, and jumped on. And it looks like everything is working now. So hopefully it is. Let's go back and check YouTube. All right. Anyway, on this week's – yep, looks like YouTube is working. On this week's live, we are discussing negligence as – applies to car accidents and truck accidents. I mean, we've all heard the commercials, right? We've heard them on TV and on the radio. If you've been injured by the negligence of another, give so-and-so lawyer a call. We all hear those, but what does it actually mean? What is negligence and what do you need to maintain a negligence cause of action or initiate a negligence cause of action as it relates to a motor vehicle accident or a truck accident, commercial vehicle accident. You need four things for a negligence cause of action. You need a duty, a breach, a causation, and damages. So we'll go through those one at a time. A duty is when it applies to accidents, we all have a duty to drive with due care. We all have a duty to properly maintain our vehicles. We have a duty to you know watch out for road hazards and anything that may come up in the common course of driving. When uh, we have a breach of that duty, we have the person that owes the duty letting it down. So another driver on the road owes you that duty of due care. Uh, an example of somebody that doesn't, doesn't owe you a duty, let's say you're driving down the MacArthur Causeway, you're watching Joe out on the jet ski in the channel doing all kinds of crazy tricks. Bob is right behind you. Bob is watching Joe too and not paying attention. He's not fulfilling his duty to you and he rear ends you. Now you could sue Bob for rear ending you because Bob owes you the duty, but Joe out on the jet ski does not owe you a duty as he's out on the jet ski and you're driving the car. So you could sue Bob, but not Joe. And the breach of that duty we talked about a little bit is when they don't fulfill that duty, when they're not using due care, they run into you, the vehicle's not properly maintained, something fails on the vehicle, which causes the accident. The, bre <coughs> the breach of that duty has to be the causation of the accident. So in our example, Bob behind you, he wasn't paying attention to the road ahead of him, didn't realize you stopped, and he runs into you. So now he's breached his duty, he's caused an accident, so we have the causation in there. And then you have to have damages. So if he runs into you with anything, any speed that's appreciable, you know, more than a couple of miles an hour, it's going to at least cause property damage. The faster you go, the more likely you are to have 
uh, personal injuries and so forth. So for another example is if, if Bob behind you runs a stop sign or Joe behind you runs a stop sign, hits your car, runs a red light, hits your car, you have the duty, you have the breach of the duty, you have the causation of the accident. And once the collision occurs, you have the damages, either property damages or personal injury damages, either one, either um, type of damages can be used to maintain a cause of action for negligence. Um, also for vehicle maintenance, let's say you're driving down the road, a wheel comes off a truck and hits your car and sends your car into a pole. You have personal injury and property damages there. You have to have all, th all four of those elements met so you could proceed with a personal injury claim for negligence. Um, one of the things I used to see a lot is when I was a policeman and doing homicide investigations, traffic deaths and the like, investigating accidents was, especially in commercial vehicle accidents is failure to maintain a vehicle. You see it a lot in car and car cases too. You see people with bald tires, you know, worn out steering components, basic cars that shouldn't be on the road. Some of the worst examples I remember from commercial vehicles was significantly worn steering linkages, um, significantly worn tires, like down to the down to the belt on the tires, where all the rubber was was off of it. And uh, one of probably one of the most egregious um, vehicle neg being negligent in maintaining a vehicle in proper condition was we had a, a dump truck accident, and I was reviewing the dump truck accident. I was representing some the uh, the family of the car who the dump truck hit. And when I was going over the investigation, I noticed when the police did wheelbase measurements, the left side wheelbase was significantly shorter than the right side wheelbase. And that to me was, you know, a big, a big thing, you know, a big red flag that drew my attention. So I looked into it further and we actually went out, the vehicles were preserved by the insurance company. We actually went out and re-inspected the vehicles. We did the measurements, we got up under the truck and we looked and what we found out is this driver wanted to carry more capacity. So he added a second rear axle. The second rear axle, when he, when he welded up the brackets and installed the axle, wasn't properly installed and it was off camber. So it would cause the rear of the truck to shake. In, in this case, it shook uncontrollably and he lost control and he hit our, our client. And upon further investigation, we realized the rear axle that he added to the truck, it didn't have brakes on it. So that affected the braking ability of the truck. And that was probably the most egregious. I've seen other things like fuel tanks added, you know, elevated fuel tanks added, elevated cargo overloading is a very popular or very common thing to have in commercial vehicle accidents. So you can have, you know, you have you have two steps of kind of two steps of negligence there that I've talked about. You have the the duty of care and a duty to maintain you know properly maintain a vehicle properly operate the vehicle you also have a duty to about who's driving the vehicle if you allow somebody to drive a vehicle let's say they're not a licensed driver they've got a bunch of duis they're impaired at the time you've let them drive the vehicle you can get jammed up on that or the person who owns the vehicle can get jammed up on that as far as allowing an unauthorized driver to drive the vehicle okay we got a few people we got 10 people on tiktok hey miami fan how's it going we have nobody on youtube yet hopefully i'm still broadcasting looks like i'm broadcasting on youtube so that looks to be going okay Anyway, in, in a personal injury accident, you know, you, you see the lawyers on TV advertising for them all the time and hear them on the radio. You see all the billboards and those cases, you know, it's obvious the reason there's so much advertising and marketing and personal injury cases is because those cases are worth a lot of money, especially when they involve commercial vehicles, because commercial vehicles, unlike um, regular vehicles, have significantly higher policies because the 
the probability or the chance that significant injuries will occur when a motor vehicle or when a commercial vehicle is involved in that are significantly higher. Whereas, you know, a, um, in an automobile, you may have a person with a 100, 300 policy. In a commercial vehicle, you also you often have policies of a million or more. And that because they have more than one vehicle on the road. And some, you know, some of the in, independent companies have the smaller companies, but the bigger companies, you know, North American, uh, Swift, and those companies have, you know, significantly large policies because they have significantly large um, um, fleets of vehicles. Another thing is um, contractors, state contractors working on the roadway. The thing I've seen is is negligently storing or negligently leaving uh, heavy equipment and commercial vehicles on the scene. Uh, there are laws and there are laws and statutes that apply when you know they're working on a limited access highway that the vehicles or the equipment have to be secured a certain distance off the highway by certain methods and they could be negligent in that duty by not properly securing those vehicles and making those vehicles a hazard um that covers it as far as you know i'm always happy to answer questions but that covers it as far as is what a negligence causes of action, what you need to maintain that negligence cause of action. And let me go down here. And okay, so let's talk a little bit about how, how a personal injury case works. So you, let's say you're involved in an accident, you're hit by another motor vehicle and you end up, you know, going to the hospital, the trauma center, or whatever it may have. You're going to have, you know, if you have any appreciable injuries, I mean, you're going to have significant medical bills. If you're transported by fire rescue from a scene, uh, you're going to have a fire rescue bill. Down here in South Florida, Dade Broward and Palm Beach, fire rescue is going to bill you for coming out and transporting you to the hospital. If you have to fly in the helicopter, you know, you have to fly air rescue, you're going to get a very significant bill. The fire rescue bills, they have to be paid right away because once they send out a bill, they don't wait. They'll, they'll put you in the collections before you know it. Um, so what, what do we do? When we intake a personal injury case where somebody's been airlifted or transported to the hospital from the scene, we inform the insurance company of our representation and we request that they pay the emergency medical bills, you know, the fire rescue bill right away and the ER bill or the trauma center bill or as much as they can pay per the policy limits on that. If it goes over the policy limits, that's where it kind of gets confusing for a lot of people. So let's say, you know, in this particular example, you're airlifted from the scene, you're Personal injury protection insurance is going to pay for that fire rescue bill for that airlift and a portion of your emergency medical expenses. And then we get into a situation where you've exhausted your personal injury protection, your $10,000 personal injury protection limits. And that's going to go really quick if you have significant injuries, especially if you need surgeries to save your life or, you know, to reset bones or they have to you know go into your chest or something like that which is not uncommon um so most doctors you know most hospitals um doctors um orthopedists that we work with clinics that we work with understand that and they'll proceed and they'll continue to treat you under a letter of protection which is basically a promise to pay when you make a recovery from the insurance company. So you proceed, you can proceed along. That's a big concern. The medical expenses are probably the number one concern that clients express to me when they're involved in a personal injury case. So we get those, you know, those doctors to continue to treat you under the person, under the letter of protection. And we wait for you to reach a position of maximum medical improvement, or if it's obvious that, you know, the damages and the injuries you sustain are going to exceed the policy limits on the case. A lot of times the insurance companies will surrender the policy limits to you right away, whether they be, you know, a 1020 policy or a 100, 300 policy. 
and you just got to make sure that you you've identified all sources of insurance if it's a commercial vehicle um, is there any other type of insurance if it's a regular motor vehicle was the person engaged in work were they portal to portal or were they driving around at the direction of their employer in their personal vehicle so you have to make sure you have all sources of insurance covered before you start accepting offers and negotiating offers on those types of cases. Um, the significant injury cases, like if you get if you get a leg ripped off or something like that, insurance companies will settle those a lot quicker than if you have what they term soft tissue injuries. The 1020 cases I get, the rear end cases where people come to me and they have the upper back and, and neck injuries and cervical injuries and the treatment is prolonged, there's physical therapy involved, there's disc herniations and impingements. Those cases are probably the toughest cases to fight with insurance companies about because they always want to underpay them. So another reason to have a lawyer on your case is insurance companies are gonna show up in your life after an accident and try to settle the case with you. I've heard stories about them even going into hospital rooms to meet with people, to offer them, you know, a few thousand dollars uh, to settle their claim. And you got to be real careful because if you end up settling your claim and your injuries turn out to be significantly more later on, you're going to have a serious problem there. Um, so you, you always want to have and studies show, multiple studies show that having a personal injury lawyer on your case will result in a higher um, amount from the insurance company than if you try to negotiate it on on your own a lot of people do try to negotiate it on i get a lot of people that call me after afterwards where they accepted a few thousand dollars because they were worried about you know how they're going to make ends meet that they're injured and all that stuff so they, they accepted a low ball amount and then later found out that their injuries are fairly significant so if that occurs you you have a serious problem another issue um we see in these cases is they take, sometimes they take a long time. Sometimes they take months or even a year or so to resolve. It all depends on the course of treatment, your doctor's order and how long it takes to reach a point of maximum, maximum medical improvement. And, you know, the, like I said, the, the little cases are the hard, hardest fought um, on the 10, 20 cases. We work, we probably work harder on those cases than we do on the bigger 100, 300 of the commercial vehicle policy cases because there's less at risk for the insurance company. So how do insurance companies come up with dollar amounts as applied to your damages? So you, there's no there's no rule or chart or anything that says if you're in a hospital, you have you know X number, X injuries that they're worth X number of dollars. What insurance companies do, the big insurance companies do, is they use a computer program called Colossus. And they put all your injury information into this computer program and it basically spits out a dollar amount. And it's always lo a low ball dollar amount. And that's what they will offer in your particular case. And if it's you recognize it as low ball dollar amount and you know from experience as a personal injury lawyer that these injuries are worth considerably more than you know you have to be willing to go into court to go to trial to fight for your clients and to file suit in the case to represent your clients to obtain justice in your clients because a lot of these accidents a lot of the serious accidents are life altering people will never be the same after they've had a significant injury in a uh, motor vehicle accident um i've had clients that came to me years later and they still have they still have pain in their back and their arm and their neck or, or and I'll give you an example. I had a lady who got rear ended and she ended up having two surgeries on her back and they offered her $15,000 for her medical, her medical expenses alone were significantly higher than that. The insurance company offered 15,000. It was like a really low ball offer. So we ended up filing suit. We got them up to, to fifty thousand dollars which was still significantly low we ended up going going the trial we went through mediation the whole nine yards we ended up going the trial and on the eva trial when we came in the day the trial was supposed to begin they coughed up the the uh the policy limits in that case and they do that at times 
they take a insurance companies for one thing insurance companies are not your friend you're never in good hands and you're never protected from mayhem for insurance companies insurance companies are in the business of making money and the way they make money is denying claims undervaluing claims and not paying claims if you're not represented by a lawyer in such an accident case you're not going to know what your rights are you're not going to know if they're under undervaluing your claim or lowballing your claim that's why you want somebody when you when you choose a personal injury lawyer you want somebody who's handled a few cases i've handled them both as a lawyer and as a accident reconstructionist working with personal injury lawyers so i kind of know it from two sides they will do all they can to avoid your claim or lowball your claim or undervalue your claim and we're the ones that have to go in and fight them to get them to pay what the actual damages are. So what are the actual damages in your case? Well, you, have, you obviously have what your medical expenses are, but you also have what your expenses are, you know, going to and from the doctor. Uh, did you miss employment? Did you lose your job? Did you have any expenses related to uh, the person, um, the, the, um, therapy afterwards did you have to buy any equipment did you have to buy any you know i had one client that had to buy a hospital bed because they couldn't sleep in a regular hospital bed i had another client that is that had to buy a um a spinning bike to exercise their leg because the doctor ordered it so we have all that then on top of all that you have your pain and suffering well what is your pain and suffering worth that's where it becomes that's where you really want an experienced lawyer in personal injury cases because you want to be able to get compensated for that pain and suffering because you have not only the pain and suffering you 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 sustained at the accident at the time of the accident you have the pain and suffering that's continued on to the present day and then you have pain and suffering that you're going to experience the rest of your life and you have to be able to evaluate that so you know you look at it attorneys look at it different ways some of them just do it based on their on their um hang on a minute got an alarm going off here All right, some of them just do it based on their experience because they handle so many cases they they know what that amount is like is, is supposed to be and then some of them do it you know based on an hour okay you're in pain 24 hours a day how much is each hour worth and it all, all depends on what scheme you come up with to to value that but that has significantly value significant value in a case and sometimes that value is well in excess of what your other expenses are you know your, your physical therapy equipment you're going to and from the doctor your prescriptions your emergency medical treatment your follow-up treatment and you also have future medical treatments doctors will make opinions about what you'll need in the future and how much that's likely to cost you on a per year basis so you have to add all that into it you know considering your life expectancy and that comes from all that information you're able to arrive at an amount that would be just so that's that's where you have to be able to be able to and willing to go into court and fight for that amount for your clients so hopefully that explains a little bit about what negligence is and you have an understanding so when you hear those commercials or you see those commercials on tv or you hear them on the radio where they say if you've been damn if you've been injured by the negligence of another call x number lawyer and they'll take care of you and you know that's why there's that's why there's lawyer personal injury lawyers billboards all over the turnpike in 95 and you see them just everywhere you see them on bus benches buses inundated with them on social media because they're they're big dollar cases and there, there's a reason they're big dollar cases because a lot of them are difficult require a lot of experience and uh you know because you're you're, all, you're always fighting for your client i get hired on a lot of those cases by other personal injury lawyers to work with them because i have a separate expertise in accident reconstruction i'm actually an expert witness in the field of accident reconstruction 
and I can sit down with an insurance company's engineer, like in a, what I usually get hired to do is review cases and do depositions. So I can sit down with an insurance company's engineer that they've hired to reconstruct the case. And let's say he's come up with, you know, a speed on one of the vehicles using conservation or linear momentum. Well, I know those formulas that I could sit down and tell where he's fudging his numbers at and why he's coming up with the speed that he's coming up with, where we're coming up with a different speed. So that's that's one bit of it. I have a significant amount of experience in doing that. So that's negligence. Any questions about negligence, feel free to ask. I'll open it up to other questions. I see Gary on YouTube has a family law question. Spit it out, Gary, and we'll try to answer it. Let's see, what's your question? All right, let's see. Anybody on, let's scroll back a little bit on TikTok and see if you have any questions that pass through. I appreciate everybody being here. How does negligence figure into a slip and fall? I don't do it. I don't do slip and fall. I do strictly motor vehicle accidents, car accidents, and um, commercial vehicle accidents. But how it works in, a, in a, a slip and fall, you still have the four elements. You have the duty, the breach, the causation, and the damages. So let's say you're going into a grocery store. A grocery store owes its customers a duty not to have hazards in the store or to warn them from hazards in the store. So let's say they have a leaky pipe or, you know, something leaking that they didn't clean up. Or, or I'll give you a perfect example here. I had a case that I referred out it involved the police officer. He was going to eat in a restaurant. It was nighttime. He was walking across the park lot, which was black asphalt. And one of the storm drains was missing. The three days beforehand, they pinned it down to the restaurant, knew that the storm drain was missing because they put an orange cone by it. So people wouldn't walk into it. Well, somebody had removed the orange cone and this officer was walking along. It's night. The There wasn't a whole lot of light out. The storm drain was missing and the cone was missing. So he fell into the storm drain and injured his arm and got you know fairly significantly injured. It'd be the same thing in a slip and fall. If there was water on the floor, they had a leaky pipe. They knew about the leaky pipe. They didn't do anything to warn you of it, to fix it. They just left it there. Okay, you have the duty. They owe the customer a duty to not have hazards or to warn of hazards. They breach that duty when they don't warn or clear hazards or clear up hazards. You fall into you fall into the storm drain or you slip on the floor. That's caused by their breach of duty and whatever injuries you have are the damages associated with that. So that's how it works on a slip and fall. All right, Gary, how can I get divorced but can't locate the X? Okay, if you can't if you want to get divorced, if you haven't gotten divorced yet, she's not your ex, she's still your wife. And if you can't locate her, I'm not sure what state you're in, but in Florida, they have a service by publication regime. And as long as you follow the regime, you know, you have to publish it in the newspaper, you have to do a diligent search affidavit and a bunch of other stuff. Once you satisfy that, the court will deem service valid and they'll proceed to, to go ahead with the divorce, whether she's there or not. But that, that's how it works in Florida. All right, Dave Dixon, guess what you did? You went to jury duty. Okay. Yeah, I get subpoenas for jury duty. I get noticed for jury duty all the time. And I tell them I was a policeman and they always they always excuse me. Thomas White, mayhem. Yeah, you're never protected for mayhem. Your insurance company does not protect you for mayhem. Your insurance company's sole purpose for their existence is to make money for their shareholders. Don't be afraid to sue your insurance company or to recover from your insurance company. Okay, Gary says the case is in Florida, then that would apply. Look, um, Florida family law form. There's one of the forms in there is the has the requirements for service by publication and just go down the list. And when you go into the clerk's office to file your affidavit, make sure you have everything checked off and you have proof that you did what you said you did. And they will accept that as service. 
Oh, let's see. User number 949 and a bunch of other numbers. I am not in your state, but thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I love doing this. I, I'm just very humbled that so many people come in and watch and comment on my videos and my social media activity. It's very humbling. And, you know, I do it for you. It's part of giving back. And like I said before in other videos, I think when you have a skill or you have certain knowledge, you have a moral obligation to share that with other people. All right, YouTube. YouTube is on. Yeah, I see YouTube on, but YouTube does have a delay on it, I'm noticing. But I'm glad it looks good. Let's see. Now TikTok is lagging. Yeah, okay. I guess I guess that goes to the wireless. I should have I should have plugged in. I should have plugged in my um my hardwire for the computer part of it, if not the phone part. All right, Kazan 9549. What percentage do lawyers get of settlement in personal injury cases under the first mo under the first million? It's 33 and one third percent. So it's one third of whatever it is under a million. As as the settlement or as the award goes up, the percentage of the, of the lawyer get goes down. In Florida, you have to have an executed retainer agreement, and you also have to have <laughs> excuse me, an executed statement of rights and personal injury cases, which basically explains to the client everything that uh, is related to the lawyer's percentage of the settlement. And mine actually has a table in it that's, and I think all lawyers are required to have this particular table that sets the, sets the amount, you know, under 1 million, it's 33 and a third percent, 1 million to whatever is up and, you know, go, as, as the settlement or as the award amount goes up the lawyer's percentage goes down okay i was just keeping you up to date sir thanks miami fan i appreciate that let's see all right thomas good to see you again i know you were here last week i'm all i'm always happy to i do three things three different types of law i do family law I do criminal defense and I do personal injury. If you have any questions regarding that in the state of Florida, I'm happy to answer those questions. I don't practice in any other state, so I don't know, you know, I don't know how they do divorces in New York or anything like that because I simply don't practice in those states. Those three areas of law, I'm fairly well versed at in the state of Florida. What do you think about mold lawsuits? Once again, I mean, it comes down to how the mold get there. Why is the mold there? Or is it somebody's negligence? And what kind of what type of injuries does it does it occur? Does it cause? So I think it falls under the same thing, although that is something. All right, now it says I got bumped off. Let's see, go back. All right, for some reason I got bumped off of of TikTok, but it didn't, it didn't close. It just seems like I got bumped off. Um, I don't know, really know anything about mold lawsuits. I know there's lots of lawyers that handle those cases and I would refer you, you know, Google it or refer you to somebody that does that, but I don't do that. I do strictly automobile accidents and personal injury cases when it comes to, when it comes to that stuff. I don't do slip and falls. I don't do, um, I don't do, you know, mold cases. I don't do, mass torts or toxic torts or anything those are all very specialized areas of law that i am not even familiar with i pretty much stick to to what i know which is the family law the criminal defense and the the personal injury auto accidents all right so do we have any other questions expand a little bit all right miami fan what do you want me to expound on Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not. We're supposed to have storms here tonight. Um, there's a cold front coming in. It's supposed to be down to the 40s tomorrow, which is you know rare for us. We get two or three of those snaps a year. It was 82 today, or last time I looked, it was 82 when I was coming back. But we haven't we haven't got the storms just yet. All right, let's look back on YouTube. No questions on YouTube. The question is above that. Okay, Miami fan, let me look. Post is back. It may have come in.
I'm not seeing a question, Miami fan. It may have come in on that point where I was bounced off. So if you ask it again, I'll, I'll go back over it. Uh, let's see here. No, I don't, I don't see. I don't see any questions from you. So if you want to ask it again, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and address it. I had a, a period where I got bumped off here and then back on, and it may have come in during that time, and I didn't see it. But I went back before that, and I went back to your last comment, and I still didn't see it. The last thing I saw from you was just keeping you up to date. Okay, so we'll get we'll give it a few minutes and see if that question comes in from Miami fan. Um, you know, I appreciate you guys coming in. Like I said, I love doing this stuff. I wish I could do it more, but you know, I had a day, I try to do it every Wednesday at six p.m. and today was close. I almost didn't make it, but um, you know, I was like a couple minutes late actually trying to get in here and get YouTube up and everything up. I had court all day today. So it was it was a little rough. It ran a little late this evening, so it was a little rough getting home or getting back to the office and getting in here and getting everything set up. All right, it's cold and dusty. Yeah, you guys are in the Panhandle, so it gets a little. That's more like South Alabama than it really is Florida. Where it takes like all day to get up there to uh, up to the Panhandle. All right, Brandon, how do you acquire new clients? Google, yeah, I have I have Google AdWords for family law and, and criminal defense. Most of my personal injury cases come from personal referrals from other lawyers, um, from a lot of people I used to work with when I was a police officer and from friends and family. Um, I've gotten a few on, on social media, and uh, but most of them do come from word of mouth referrals. Um, I get a lot when it comes to car accidents, you know, it's, like I said, I have an expertise in that field as far as investigating them. So I get a lot of cases that way. And I've gotten, I've gotten personal injury cases from, you know, referrals from former clients, as well as referrals from cases I investigated when I was a police officer. And then they found out that I was an attorney. So you get a, most of them are word of mouth, but they come, they come from everywhere, I guess. All right, Miami fan, I still don't see another question from you, but certainly if you do pop it in here in the next couple of minutes, any other questions? Nobody on Google with the or nobody on YouTube with a question. Yeah, I think we're all having issues here because I see, I mean, TikTok seems to be running slow now, but YouTube, YouTube seems to be humming along at the moment. So that seems to be working pretty swell there. Okay, well, if that's it, that's that's your your story or your lesson on on negligence for today. I hope it I hope everybody understands it. What I try to do is I try to explain these these legal terms and common everyday terms so that everybody understands it. So you don't have to be a lawyer to understand it. One of the most common complaints that I get or one of the most common comments I get from clients that have gone to other lawyers before they came to me is they didn't understand what their lawyer was telling them. Um, you know, they'll say, you know, I remember him saying something about about the, uh, you know, the personal injury protection coverage. Or I remember him saying something about equitable distribution. I remember that term coming up, but I can't tell you what he said. I try to take those, I try to take those concepts like negligence and equitable distribution and all those legal terms that, you know, you're not going to know unless you're actually a lawyer and just break them down into common terms. Do you take any cases in Lee County? Yes. I'll take personal injury cases in Lee County. I'll take personal injury cases pretty much throughout the state if they involve a commercial vehicle or if they involve or, or death cases, unfortunately. Um, I, you know, one, one of my expertise was when I was a policeman was the investigation of traffic death cases. And that's just kind of my thing. And 
you know, I'm very comfortable doing those. And I like to do, you know, significant injuries and death cases, especially involving com commercial vehicles, because I really get into those types of investigations and, and analysis. So if it's, if it's a personal injury case, yeah, I'll, I'll review it and pr take it pretty much anywhere in the state. Criminal, um, it depends on the case. If it's a, you know, if it's a high profile case, I'll certainly take it. Um, I've had a couple of those. Um, family law cases, usually, usually when it comes to family law, it's not financially feasible for a client to pay me to travel outside of the South Florida area when there's so many other lawyers around that can do it for a lot cheaper. I get people, I get people in Orlando. I've had a lady in Ocala, a um, lady in Jacksonville that tried to hire me or wanted to hire me on a family law or a divorce case. And I basically just tell them, I go, listen, it would be crazy to hire me to you know, pay that travel time coming from Miami to go up there when you can find somebody who is in your area that is competent and you know can handle your case. One thing I always tell people about hiring a lawyer is you have to hire a lawyer that you have confidence in, that you think the lawyer has confidence in you and that you can relate to and that you can, most importantly, that you can communicate with and talk to. You have to, especially when you're dealing with family law and criminal defense, because there's there's some things you're going to tell your lawyer that you're not going to tell anybody else. And you have to be comfortable telling your lawyer and communicating those things to them. All right, let's see. Popped a couple questions in here. Brother violated probation in California and left the country. If he has a warrant, they'll pick him up on customs when he comes back in. I see a lot of those at the seaport and the airport down here. Would he get more time in jail above the mist? I guess about for not showing up. Yeah, because now they're going to hit him with the original charge as well as the probation violation, I would guess. What I see a lot of here in Florida is, is prosecutors will offer these sweet deals with a term of probation. And a good example of them are drug cases. And it's always been my opinion that you cannot plead somebody who has a drug problem on a drug case to a term of probation unless they are off the drugs, unless they've been, you know, in therapy, either residential or outpatient. And, you know, you have confidence that they're going to confidence that they're going to be able to stay off drugs for the probationary period. Because once you violate that probation, that's another charge. The state's going to charge you with the violation and probation. And in Florida, you only need two things to prove a violation of probation. Number one, you're on probation. Number two, you did something to violate it. When my clients come to me, when they violate their probation and they come to me, I tell them, you know, I tell them right at the beginning, be proactive about it. If you do something and you, you're going to get jacked for the probation violation, contact me. Let me get a hold of the probation officer and the probation agency and get into court, get ahead of it right away all right so he didn't finish probation i see that a lot people people you know they either didn't pay the fine or they didn't do like one or two things on the probation at the end and end up getting a violation a lot of times you know they'll issue a warrant and a lot of times you can get in if it's you know within a relatively short period of time you can get in and resolve that warrant and get their probation closed out with them paying that fine or whatever that last step is that they had to do. The longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes, of course. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, that'll wrap it up for this evening. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed our talk on negligence. And as always, I enjoy everybody just coming in and asking questions about the three areas of law that I practice. Uh, once again, my name is Patrick McGeehan. Uh, my main office is in Miami, downtown Miami. Actually, my only office at this time is in downtown Miami on Burkle Avenue. I practice three things. I practice family law, which includes you know divorce, domestic violence, basically everything related to a family relationship except adoptions. I just do not do adoptions and I do not do uh, termination of parental rights. I just personally feel there's a bad mojo in termination cases. Um, everything else I, I do, criminal defense, I do a lot of DUI, a lot of drug possessions, um, 
strangely, a bunch, especially lately in the last year or so, a lot of sexual battery cases for some reason. I have people coming to me for sexual battery, just like one after another for several months in a row, and I'm not really sure why. But um, I practice in federal court in the Southern District of Florida, as well as in state court in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach are my main areas. I'll go down to Monroe County, which is in the Florida Keys. I really don't like going down there because they have, I mean, my personal opinion is, is if you're not from the Keys, if you're from Miami or you're from someplace else and you go to the Keys for a case, you don't get treated the same way as the local lawyers do. And if you're a tourist down there, they do not give any leeway to tourists. They jack tourists, I think, as much as they can down there. And it's just it's just a very different system than the system works very differently than it does in Miami, Dade, and Broward. Miami, you know, Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County. I'm happy to take a case there. Those are are my my prime counties. And you know, although I get every now and then I'll get stuck with a case in Hendry County or Martin County or something like that. Um, my preferred counties are Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach for family law and criminal defense. Uh, significant injury accidents or, God forbid, a death case, you know, an accident case involving a death, I will evaluate it for possible, possibly anywhere in the state um, just because, you know, that's that's my thing, as I said before. So if you ever have any questions on that, there's several ways you can reach me. Um, I'm on, of course, YouTube. Of course, I'm on TikTok, as you see here in YouTube Live. I'm also on Facebook. Um, I have the law offices of Patrick J. McGee and Page on Facebook, and I also have Ask a Florida Ask a Florida Divorce Lawyer page on Facebook. You can get me there. You can get me Instagram, the Magic City Lawyer, of course TikTok, Magic City Lawyer, uh, Twitter at PJM or PJ McGee and Law. And if you look on my Twitter, if you have a family law case going on, I have the first pin tweet on my Twitter is a cheat sheet that I developed that'll save you money in a family law case. So if you have a family law case in the state of Florida, um, that information could be valuable to you. Other states, I don't know, you may wanna review it and see if it works, but I know it works in Florida and it has saved my clients money. Um, it, there's a link on that first pin tweet about, about saving money on attorney's fees. Click on the link, put your name and email address and it emails you the 23 page cheat sheet right away you can review it and so far my clients love that i implemented that about two years ago and they just love it and the ones who do use it have reported saving you know a thousand or two thousand sometimes more and they just seem to love it um like i said again we do law on the law life in the law live every wednesday at 6 p.m god willing and the creek don't rise i will be here um, you know, I posted it back into the office from court today to get in here because I just wanted to be with you guys and, and interact with you and, and give you this information and disseminate this information. Also, on my other social media platforms, I post stuff daily related to my law practice. So if you want to subscribe to any of those or you want to follow any of those, you can get daily information about what I'm up to, what kind of cases I'm handling, um, commentary on cases that make the news and other, I guess, useful information you can call it. Thanks. I enjoyed it. We'll do it again next Wednesday, 6 p.m., same place, same time. I'll see you then.